Welcome everyone to the Coin Brief Podcast. Um, Sean Wentz here with Evan Faggart, and we talk about the latest news in the cryptocurrency space every week and uh, relating issues to you know Bitcoin and uh, the tech world and intersecting uh, you know intersecting stuff between finance and tech and, and how this is all playing out in this brand new Wild West digital economy. Um, so first story we're going to start out with today is that Bill Gates, the co-founder of Microsoft and the Bill and, Mil- Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, has uh, talked about Bitcoin recently in the news. And he basically says that it's he likes it because it's a cheap payment system. It's cheaper than the regular banking system. And he thinks that it can be good for getting banking services to poor third world countries, uh, people who don't have banking services and who need to manage their, their finances. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies could be a pretty good way to uh, get financial services to them in a cheap way without having to you know go through banks and, and any of that uh, hassle. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the actual quote that he said during the Bloomberg interview. The, the Bloomberg interviewer asked him if he thinks that uh, Bitcoin is, is a good way to accomplish you know, his, his financial like, goals of getting to the unbanked. And Bill Gates replied, you know, Bitcoin is, a, is better than currency in that you don't have to be physically in the same place. And of course, for large transactions, currency can get pretty inconvenient. Uh, there's all kinds of fees associated with you know, um, regular currency transactions between banks and stuff like that. Um, but then he went on to add to that, and he said that the customers we're talking about aren't trying to be anonymous. They're willing to be known. So Bitcoin technology is key, and you can add to it, or you could build a similar technology where there's enough attribution where people feel comfortable that this has nothing to do with terrorism or any type of money laundering. So, Bill Gates likes that Bitcoin is a cheap financial system, but he dislikes how it can theoretically be used for money laundering and terrorism. So, um, Evan, you want to jump into this and offer your initial thoughts on Bill Gates' take on this? I think he has the right mindset but like his heart's in the right place i guess you could say but he just has the wrong idea about what bitcoin is because i feel like he's viewing it from a perspective where it's not used as a currency but it's used as a means of transferring wealth so like you you send bitcoin overseas you put money, you put dollars on the Bitcoin, send it overseas and get, you know, some foreign currency out of it. But the goal... Remittances, kind of, right? Yeah, remittances. But, the you know, the goal is to... That's just an intermediary state or an intermediate stage. The goal is to make Bitcoin the, like, widely accepted currency. You don't have to tr- to exchange it into another currency. Yeah. Better than currency because it eliminates all the problems of traditional currency well well, that's not true because bitcoin is currency it's just better than traditional currency that doesn't mean it's something different but and then as far as terrorism and money laundering goes i mean i guess terrorism that would be a legitimate argument if they were actually using bitcoin i think there have been several sources to confirm that no no terrorist organization is using bitcoin yeah it's kind of a floating Um, rumor at this point yeah and Money laundering, like, from a libertarian perspective, what's wrong with money laundering? Like, the reason why people have to launder their money is because their businesses are illegal and they shouldn't be illegal in the first place. Like, selling drugs, marijuana mainly, but, you know, there's an argument for legalizing the harder drugs. Mm -hmm, We won't get get into that here, though. Although we should sometime, though. Illegal gambling. Like, why is gambling illegal? 
prostitution, why is prostitution illegal? You know, so a lot of the money laundering isn't this terrible crime in itself. It's just a consequence of things that are unnecessarily illegal. So saying that Bitcoin can be used for money laundering, yeah, that's true, it can, but it's still not a very valid argument against um, Bitcoin because um, once you say it can be used for money laundering, you also have the burden of proving that outlawing all those businesses that do end up laundering their money, you have to prove that those are that those um, prohibitions are just. Yeah. And so th then that that kind of goes on a whole another level. Like we're not really talking about Bitcoin anymore. We're talking about like much bigger issues, like things that, like I just said. You know, the drug war, prostitution. Those have been illegal for, you know, over a century. Why are they? What's the reasoning behind it? Um, Moral it prudes. Yep. It ultimately goes back to legislating morality, but is that the government's business? So you have to prove all that. You have to, you have to, you either implicitly um, support all of those arguments or you have to um, give your own arguments to justify all that if you're going to say that money laundering is bad. So the two arguments he made why he's like scared of bitcoin i guess you could say not very good arguments which it's kind of disappointing coming from a genius like bill gates it's interesting to see what bill gates is, is going to do um in terms of bitcoin or cryptocurrency you know because he's right that it is probably the best way to get banking services to the unbanked in third world countries that's what most people in the Bitcoin community believe, that that's where a huge untapped market, you know, these people have, you know, relatively advanced mobile phones that have the capacity to transmit digital payments, including Bitcoin payments. And that's way easier to get to them than like a Bank of America account or a Chase account, you know, so that's... Yeah, because the most popular remittance... Uh, program is Western Union's MoneyGram, or no, that's that's two separate things. It's MoneyGram is a separate thing, but Western Union, um, mm -hmm. they have a wire transfer service that's like tailored towards uh, remittances, and the fees are like fifteen twenty percent. Yeah, uh, just because they know that people will pay them because uh, the people that the people who are receiving the money like need it to survive. So, you know, the senders will pay that 20% fee. And there's um, no other options. There's not enough competition yeah. to lower those fees. But then also like there's super high fees on the receiver end too. Like, um, like you got to pay like a 15% fee, I guess, to send the money. But then, um, the banks or the, uh, Western union, like receiving areas. I don't really know exactly what they're called where people get their, their money, these poor people, um, I've read that there's super high fees there too. And so, you know, they, like, by the time the money actually gets into the hand of the person that's meant for, um, it's just a fraction of what their, you know, family member overseas sent to them. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's really sad because, you know, these people, like, remittances um, could like really build a very sturdy foundation for an economy to, to come up in these, you know, struggling, um, countries, but you know, the bank fees just ruin all that. Yeah. So yeah, of course, anything, um, obviously being a cryptocurrency news podcast, we're like, yeah, Bitcoin's the best thing, but you know, realistically anything that gets around those fees will help those people, you know, yeah, yeah, monumentally better than a bank wire transfer, but it you know it does seem like cryptocurrency, Bitcoin specifically, has you know done the best job at doing that so far. And yeah, yeah. it it's just that Bill Gates just doesn't like the illicit aspects of it, so he's trying to he's going to try and make something that adds to Bitcoin that makes it so that people's identities are linked to it. Or make an alternative cryptocurrency where identities are linked to it. So that, like, I, I mean, maybe he's just afraid of, like, government regulations or something. Uh, but I personally, I don't I don't think it really matters. 
whether you know pe people in these third world countries have their identities linked to their to their currency but he thinks that that's a huge hurdle that needs to be overcome in order to like achieve some kind of legitimacy in the government's eye because the government is super concerned about money laundering and terrorism well i mean they already have that don't they like um that i saw something where you can make like a custom bitcoin address and put your name in it you know um oh yeah that's true i think um it might have been rush wallet that did that or something else or um no one name.io did that where you can attach your name to a bitcoin address but even that that's not your real like government identity you can make right. up a username for that that is attached yeah, to an address that's true these these government types and these pro establishment types want something that links your your, your legal government name to your virtual currency finances yeah but i don't I mean, obviously, I don't understand where they're coming from because, you know, like all this, all that just seems stupid to me. But like, do they not realize that, you know, thing and it actually does it much better because there's no public ledger? Uh, you know, you can you can analyze the blockchain and figure out the identity of behind these um, addresses, but you can't trace uh, cash, you know, paper bills at all um mm -hmm. and that's and, what they hate about, that's probably one of the things they hate about the old system they can't trace it that easily they want to yeah, be able to trace they're, it they're saying they're saying like oh we we can't that you need to put an identity to it um that's the only thing like you it's, it's anonymous and so it can't be legitimate like you know the value will never last because of this you know one one thing that I think is a, that I have decided that is a flaw, you know, mm -hmm. so it's not even worth your time. Just keep using dollars. Well, dollars has that same feature built into it as well, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but that's, you except know, that's online. Also not. If you try and use dollars yeah. online, then your identity is linked to it. Yeah, of course, with, you know, with credit cards and things like that. But, um, those online usage are those clear market things, you know, that pose no, you know, threat and air quotes. Uh, the, you know, drug dealers aren't going to use their credit cards and debit cards to buy and sell drugs. You know, they're, they're using cash. So what difference does it make if they use Bitcoin? It's the same thing. Well, because the, their, their argument is that Bitcoin enables them to do it online instantly super easily like relatively anonymously especially if they use coin mixing services so bitcoin is like this this revolutionary like new system that enables th these hardened criminals and, and bad people and bad guys and terrorists and all these money launderers and stuff suddenly they have this this new option available to them that allows them to transact instantly virtually over the internet globally uh with you know, a fairly reliable money system that their identity is not attached to. So that's what all these government and pro-establishment types are super paranoid about because this has never happened before. They're like, holy mm -hmm. shit, people are transacting money online and we can't tell who they are? Which means that there's less face-to-face -face interactions with drug dealers, which means less people get killed over drugs. Like, oh, yes. that's, oh my God, that's such a terrible feature in Bitcoin. It, it enables all this evil. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Just, it reduces you know, violence. It's just such a bad argument, but you, yeah. you know you can't you can't expect people to you know uh, just become Bitcoin experts overnight. Like it definitely, like I'm definitely not even anywhere close to a Bitcoin expert. You know you've been around in the Bitcoin community way longer than I have. I don't know if you consider yourself an expert. So. I'm still not an expert, dude. Not even close. Yeah. So. Like experts you know, are the people like Andreas Antonopoulos who right. actually can understand the computer science underlying all of that. They're the experts. I don't know shit about computer science. Right. So you know, we can't we can't expect you know everybody to just you know as soon as they hear about it they just you know automatically know all the solutions to the possible you know flawed arguments they might have because. You know, I you know when I was before I became sold on Bitcoin, I had a lot of the same arguments too, and it took me you know like a year and a half to get over them. So, but you know, it's still fun to make fun of people like that, though. Yeah, and 
like I'm kind of disappointed that there's still people like that who want to just <laughs> control everyone's lives and and you know cast a moral judgment on people halfway across the world for you know making a transaction with their money. Like leave people alone. Let, let them let them transact how they want. Let free trade happen. And if you do that, then violence, actual actual real violence will be decreased and that's already been shown to happen with the rise of darknet markets um which we'll actually get into a little bit later in the podcast yeah yeah i think that's really you know the whole underlying source of of bitcoin's creation is that people just we just want to control each other for whatever reason uh you know if we weren't so controlling over each other's lives um bitcoin maybe might not would have been created because then there would be no need to like force the control out of other people's hands but um mm -hmm. you know so it all it all comes from the fact that for whatever reason people just want to tell each other what to do and so we we have to have these libertarian kids make these like you know digital inter systems. digital internet monies to, yeah, that can't to make be it censored. impossible to do that. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, best of luck to the freedom fighters in the cryptocurrency world. You're going to have to fight against the likes of Bill Gates now. Who wants to <laughs> identify you? So, um, moving on to the next topic this week. Um, one of the huge, huge, major things that came out this week is that Circle which is a relatively new Bitcoin company uh, providing Bitcoin services to people, uh, has opened its doors to the whole world. Uh, they were previously in beta, limited to a you know certain amount of people who had access. And now it's open to everyone. And basically, the main appeal of Circle, it seems like to me, that wasn't available anywhere else before, is that now it's possible to buy Bitcoin instantly using a credit or debit card and have it available right away. You can leave it in your Circle account if you want or transfer it to a separate wallet application or put it in a paper wallet or whatever you want. Bottom line is instant Bitcoin access available to anyone who has a debit or credit card, which is pretty huge. That wasn't really available anywhere else before previously like one of the best options was coinbase which you would have to place an order and wait for like five days to get the bitcoin in your account uh or go on local bitcoins and set up a meeting with someone at the local coffee shop or something and pay in cash which is kind of inconvenient or on local bitcoins go on and make a purchase with paypal you know hope that um hope that the person you're transacting with is, is legitimate and you know reliable and stuff now circle just makes all of that kind of obsolete actually as long as you have a debit or credit card and you, just, you just buy it instantly um there's pretty much no fees really uh there's just a fee there's just like s tiny banking fees that they couldn't get around and even that goes away if you like instantly connect your bank account to it so uh you know we've we've previewed we've talked a little bit about circle before and previewed their services but now they're totally available and um yeah it opens up br brand new possibilities for for buying pressure really uh, for the price and also for people who just want to get Bitcoin instantly in really like any amount you want, any small amount or any large amount. Um, Evan, have you, have you tried out circle yet or gotten any experience with this? No, I haven't tried circle yet, but I definitely need to, um, see, I, I've never been exposed to the inconveniences of, of buying Bitcoin cause I've never actually bought any Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I've told this story before, so yeah, um, freelance payments and Bitcoin and stuff yeah, like that. So, but, yeah, but so yeah, I should definitely probably try Circle because it seems pretty cool to just be able to type in your credit card information and and buy it. But I have kind of an unpopular opinion about this. 
Okay, hit me. I don't think this is really a big deal at all. Okay. Let's... So, all right. you can buy Bitcoin instantly, no fees with your credit card. Mm -hmm. That's awesome if you're already buying Bitcoin. Uh, what does Circle bring to the table that's going to make my mom go and buy some Bitcoin? Because that's what we need right now. Uh, you know, because at the end of the day, you still have to convince people why they should buy Bitcoin so they can go to a store and buy something when they could just go to the, when they could just not buy Bitcoin and go to the store and buy something with cash or credit. Because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, Circle is cool because it makes buying Bitcoin a lot more efficient, a lot faster, all this stuff. Um, but it's not really going to encourage adoption. You like you can tell people, oh, well, you can buy it instantly. Well, why am I going to buy it in the first place? You know, you have to convince people to buy it before you can show them how awesome it is to buy it instantly. And, yeah, you know, that's just what I think about it. Yeah, um, I think there's there's a pretty wide spectrum of people who would be potential buyers of Bitcoin. Of course, you know, the circle development isn't going to convince any of the people who are already really skeptical from the beginning and who are opposed to it and, and you know, don't want to get involved with it. They consider it a, a Ponzi scheme and whatever their criticisms, criticisms are. I think this has a real potential to impact the people who were already on the fence about Bitcoin, who have been kind of watching it in the news lately and, you know, think it might be disruptive and think it might be fun to just experiment with. Uh, who might want to get involved with like the new newest technology and finance and things like that. So the people who are already on the fence, but before they would look into ways of buying Bitcoin and they're like, oh man, I've got to meet with someone in a coffee shop who I don't know, or I've got to link my bank account to Coinbase and then wait five days for it. So I've like, I got to place the order, like my money is gone and then I got to wait five days to get my Bitcoins. I'm not sure I want to do that. Like, Circle allows those kind of people who are on the fence and kind of don't really like the buying options that were available to them already to have like an instant, like, you know, impulse buying, right? There's a lot of people who do impulse buys. They decide one day, it's like, okay, I'm going to get involved with this. I'm going to do this. And it's like, they might not feel that same way the next day because like the price drops or whatever, but like, they have the option now to buy it instantly when they have the impulse to buy, right? So that that's, I think, that's the main difference that Circle uh, brings to the table. And, like, I don't want to say for sure that we'll see another Bitcoin bubble because I don't think it's for sure. But if another bubble happens, Circle is going to be a huge, huge factor in that because people are going to be able to just buy into the bubble instantly and you know get along for the ride right away without having to wait at all and just impulse buy boom you're in circle holds your bitcoins or transfer them to a separate wallet so impulse buys that's i think the main main thing this brings to the table well that's a good point because there there were a few times before i started um writing for coin brief where i was like okay I'm just going to make an account with an exchange and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to buy some Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, the, ex the exchange I chose was Bitstamp for whatever reason because that was the first thing that popped up when I Googled Bitcoin exchange. Um, and so I made an account and I was like, okay, I'm not putting my social security I'm not giving my social security number to this website. I'm not giving my bank account number to this website. Um, it, you know, and then it all like um, like a like some kind Identification, of proof of, yes, proof of residence, like, yeah, all that proof crazy of stuff. Residence. And then it was like, and then it asked for like some kind of bill. Like you, you just need a bill to prove that you like that you're an actual whatever, person who lives yeah, for whatever at a security place reason and like, in the United States. You know, well. I was like, well, I don't want to give them my social security number. I don't want to give them my bank account, driver's license number. I don't want to give them all that. And then on top of all that, I live at home, so I don't have any bills that I can show them. Um, so, you know, it's not really worth my time. It's a huge hassle. Yeah, so so that's actually a good point. 
Um, but still, those people, those potential impulse buyers, it, they are an extremely small minority compared to the skeptics out there who would be convinced if they had um, like a bonus option with their salary or if they could have an option to get their wages paid in Bitcoin as like an investment thing. Um, that would do way that's that's going to do way more for Bitcoin than making it easier for people to just buy it with a credit card. Um, especially especially now that the, that the price is like, you know, hit through the floor right now. It's at you know, it's at three thirty. Nobody nobody's gonna buy yeah. it all. I should nobody's have mentioned that at the, the beginning of the podcast down. that the price has actually dropped in the past week by like eighteen percent just in the past week and and we've fallen from like 400 last week to around 330 right now and, and some people are predicting that we're going to see a retest of 266 dollars which was the previous all-time high of tw of early 2013 so yeah price price going down yeah that's you know that's definitely not very encouraging for impulse buyers even if they can buy it instantly so right you know, the first the first thing that has to happen is the price has to stop falling, and then if we want like you know significant growth, not just you know people who are like marginal skeptics who would who only need just one little reason to buy in, um, we we you know we have to get people who otherwise if if they have to put existing wealth into it, they're not going to buy into it. They have to. You know, they have to get it through like, you know, some kind of, you know, bonus system with their job or something. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Circle Circle's really awesome. It's really cool. It's filling a demand that's been around for, you know, probably at least a year, maybe a year and a half or two years. So that's cool. But I just don't think um, it's this huge you know, turning point in Bitcoin's history, like some people are making it out to be. Yeah, that's that's why I kind of I I made the qualifying premise be that if there's another bubble, then that's like the only reason why there would be a lot of people putting ex their existing wealth into Bitcoin because they think it'll it'll grow their wealth. Like if the price starts rising steadily from 300 back to 400 again and then rises to 500 relatively quickly and then 600 again then like the people who have been watching this for a while they'll be like okay shit this thing is going way up again this might be another bubble i want to get rich you know the greed factor comes in and then they if they know about circle that'll probably be their best option for for buying into the to, into the next hype train but like that's assuming another bubble happens again at all which might never happen and if it does happen it might not happen until like late next year like once all this merchant adoption madness kind of settles out and like <laughs> once we figure out what's happening with mining centralization and, and you know miners not being profitable anymore so there's a lot of downward pressure questions happening but if we have another bubble circle will allow them to kind of jump on board pretty quickly and just just during this segment i pulled out my phone to, to just like kind of demonstrate how quick it is buying from circle and i just i just did it within 30 seconds like all i had to do was open up my circle app or not they don't have an app yet but i w opened up the web app in right. google chrome and just signed in typed in 10 10 usd and uh you know i already have my bank account linked it's verified and stuff and hit deposit boom um i was i don't know if my uh, webcam can can see it but there's a verification message you just deposited ten dollars from your bank um into your circle account and boom it's it's there i can i can hit send and uh, enter a bitcoin address for my separate wallet application on my phone and um and send it there and it's and it's instant so that's i mean that's pretty cool like i've been i've been in bitcoin for like I've been aware of it since 2011 and I've actually only held Bitcoin for almost almost two years um, been holding it and like back then it's hard to get a hold of like before Coinbase there was basically only local Bitcoins and a few random exchange well I mean then we go back to Ma the Mt. Gox days which was madness uh, like 
super, super inconvenient and super hassle. Now it's just easier than ever. So pretty, pretty good inv advancement. Um, and now it's easier than ever to buy Bitcoin. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know if it's going to provide a lot of upward pressure on the price, but it does provide an, a brand new, very quick outlet for people to jump on board the next hype train, the next bubble, if it happens. So can we can we talk about bubbles? Yeah. All right. Do you, okay. What? What the issue I have with people talking about price bubbles is that, um, maybe maybe I'm just being like unnecessarily picky, um, but there has only been one actual bubble in the entire history of Bitcoin. Okay, and that was the Mt. Gox bubble. Um, uh -huh. when, when the price, when the price went up to like 50 or went up to like a hundred and then crashed to 50 or like whatever it was. And people were like all these bubbles, those weren't bubbles. Those were just fluctuations. Um, a, a bubble happens when the price gets artificially pumped up. Like when, with Mt. Gox, when Willie and Marcus were, putting hundreds of thousand dollars on the books without actually transacting any money that was artificially pumping up the price um hmm. that that's what a bubble is bubbles happen because of things like uh, credit expansion from fractional reserve banking through direct inflation for money printing um or through fraudulent things like making you know false transactions Think you know things that pump up the price, but once once those factors go away, the price falls down. So, so when people are like, "Is there going to be another bubble? Is there going to be another bubble?" Well, unless there's another Mt. Gox, no, there's not going to be another bubble. There's of course going to be price fluctuations. It's going to go up again, and then it's going to crash. Again. But you wouldn't but, say that's a bubble. But no, that like that's that's not a, it's not even close to a bubble. Like that happen that happens every day in the stock market. Like if you if you look at um, the lifetime history of a company's stock, you know it's not it's not a straight line. It's jagged. It does this, but it goes constantly upward. That's what Bitcoin does. It, the The fluctuations are just more pronounced because um, there's less of a user base, so each transaction has more influence on the price. Um, but it's just kind of a pet peeve I have. Like it really, it really gets on my nerves when people on Reddit talk about the next bubble, and then they put all this like technical analysis into like predicting the next bubble, um, and like the highs and lows of the bubble. It's it's not a bubble, guys. It's just you know normal market activity. Yeah. Uh, a bubble is when is when it goes from two hundred dollars in October to a thousand in November like happened with Mt. Gox and it was because of it was because of fraudulent activity going on. Yeah, that's fraudulent. Um, it's fake basically. Yeah. yeah, that's a bubble. But, you know, when it goes up to 100 and then goes back down to 50, uh that's pretty insignificant compared to what we saw in Mt. Gox because that's just normal trading. You know, there's nothing yeah. bubbly going on there. I think that when what you're t describing, like when people in the Bitcoin space talk about bubbles, I think what they're referring to is legitimate trading. It's not fake. It's not fraudulent like what the Willy bot was with Mt. Gox. It's actual real people putting real money in. But the bubble is is that people, lots and lots and lots of people with a lot and a lot of money, investors who want to get rich, uh, putting money in and expecting it to go higher and higher and higher. And that's what it does. It just keeps going higher as people buy in and, and they think it's going to go up forever. And then eventually, like, it hits a breaking point where there's no more money to go in. And that's when the bubble bursts and, like, there's a lot of sell-offs and then, and then it crashes. So, I like, I don't know what, like, the legal definition is or even what the dictionary definition is of a bubble. But, like... They're they're referring to just like people getting in who aren't in it for the long haul, who aren't in it for the technology. They're just in it to get rich quick, 
and they put a lot of money in hoping that it keeps going up forever, you know, irrational greed, and that's what creates the bubble dynamic of just, just constantly increasing. And yeah, it's it's like it's debatable like how much of a factor that was in Mount Gox because like I mean I I was one of those people who put a lot of money in during that bubble and I did relatively well for myself by putting in, you know, around the 700 range and then it went up to 1000 and 1100 and then divested most of it, so I did pretty well in that, you know, bubble. So I, I, there's a lot of people who did that as well and that's why the price went down after a thousand um but then there's also the factor of the willy bot that came out and 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 this fraudulent trading and all the shadiness of mount gox so who knows how real the price of 1000 actually was um but like for for all intents and purposes looking at the market it was basically a bubble like just the market dynamics of, of the price constantly rising based on irrational um, greed. And then it crashes when, you know, when the greed shows that people aren't going to get rich instantly and that they kind of wasted their a, a good portion of their money by buying in at $1,000. And that well, same kind of thing happened earlier in 2013 as well. Uh, in the spring of 2013, when the price rose from like $60 to $266, and anyone who bought at 266, thinking that the price was going to keep going up forever at that time, um, lost a lot of money in that bubble because then the bubble popped and the price crashed temporarily um, after that. And then, the, like, well, there was another bubble as well in like 2011, but that's that's farther back. I, I understand why people call it bubbles. So, you know, that that's why I said may, maybe I'm just being nitpicky. Um, but when I when I hear people talking about how they're hoping for the next bubble, they're so excited for the next bubble. Um, to, to me, they're, you know, bubble bubbles are really bad because I learned about I I my experience with bubbles comes from learning about business cycles and how bubbles are created through unsustainable growth. Um, so bubbles are, you know, actually, and a real bubble is actually very dangerous. Um, and when it pops, it could, every, every bubble has a potential to collapse the entire economy. Um, but these little pockets of upward pressure on the price, um, like, yeah, they're, that those are really fun. Um, and it's tough when it goes down, but it's nothing that threatens, you know, the very um, economic infrastructure of Bitcoin. So, it, yeah, like it. I guess, I guess you can call it a bubble w without like really being wrong about anything. Um, I think it promotes the wrong type of behavior because you know people want this kind of like chaotic you know, volatile world where, you know, they're rich one second and then tomorrow they're, they have nothing. Um, and then it's like, keep holding, you'll just get rich again later yeah. on. Yeah. They're, they're like, Oh, we want bubbles. We want bubbles. You know, like why, why do you want Mount Gox's? Like, why, like, did you have fun? And did you have fun in 2008? That was a real bubble. Um, I, I but, literally saw a Reddit post earlier today, a self post on Reddit where someone was saying, we need Mark Carpoli's back. Why did everyone, you know, trash Mount Gox? We we went to 1,000 under Mark Carpoli's, but now we're down to 300 under Coinbase slash BitPay slash VC funding and all that. Bring back Mount Gox. We need we need the fraudulent <laughs> Willy bot again. And they were, like, totally serious. And it got, like, 10 upvotes. And I'm like, wait, for real? You want the fraud back? <laughs> like, yeah, oh, my but... God, these people are just greedy. Yeah, I think, you know, I think like I think that's the kind of behavior you know, talking about bubbles promotes, because uh, these people they're like, oh, just, just wait until the next bubble, like buy in right now, then wait until the next bubble, and uh, you know, then you'll then you'll get rich. Um, yeah, that's true, but you know, the same thing happens in the stock market with like Microsoft stock or whatever kind of stock. Um, but you, you know, you wouldn't call every little um, peak and trough that happens 
month to month, year to year, you know, bubbles. Mm. Like, you know, f- like financial journalists don't talk about that. They, you know, they don't, they don't talk about price fluctuations on the stock market like that. Um, the term bubble is, you know, saved for something really serious. It's called a business cycle, mm. um, that economy. And I think we should put that same seriousness into Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a very serious uh, thing now. Super serious. Um, it's you know it's a, it's a really legitimate financial uh, investment vehicle, and it's also you know a growing currency. So you know to to talk about how awesome bubbles are, and how much we need bubbles. Uh, you know, I think I think that's kind of you know I think that's kind of bad. Uh, it's I just th- you the know, greed like, talking. Like I said, yeah, I think it, I think it promotes bad, uh, you know, illogical behavior, and it's going to make people lose a lot of money. Yeah. Well, I mean, on the other like extreme side of the spectrum, like you got to look at the people who misuse the term bubble like even worse. Like they're not they're not looking at the thousand dollar price point in late 2013 and saying that's a bubble. There are people earlier this year who look at you know the price of Bitcoin at 500 or 600, and they're like. It's a bubble. Like no matter what, it's a bit, Bitcoin is a bubble. Like they they think it's a bubble if the price is above a hundred dollars, and like just because they they don't they don't like it, they see it as a Ponzi scheme, and that's why they say the word bubble. Like they still think it's gonna like pop even more. So I mean, that's that's super misuse of the term bubble. Like right. they don't well, even the, know the I market mean, dynamics. Th- those people don't know anything about how value and prices work. You know, they're just they're just jealous that they didn't get in when everyone else did, and they're not rich right now. I guess like Peter Schiff. Peter Schiff is one of the biggest Bitcoin critics, and he every single time, well, not every single time, but a lot of the times when he bashes Bitcoin, he's like, "I am so mad that I did not buy in when it was fifty cents per Bitcoin because I would have put a thousand dollars into it and I'd be retired now." And he's like, "Bitcoin's a bubble; it's never gonna last. You know, there's no real value." And like, okay, so why are you so mad about not investing in it? You yeah. know, he's that's still just hoping being, that it's a bubble right now and that it'll pop you know, and he'll have a chance to get back in low. Yeah, like that. That's just being disingenuous. Like, you, you, you know, Bitcoin's real. You're just mad that you didn't profit off of it. Yep, greed. When talking. you could have. Yeah. Greed, greed, greed. That's but, why you know, people that's... need to get dedicated to the technology itself, to the community, to the ecosystem, to the infrastructure. Like, it's not, it's not a get rich quick scheme. Don't even consider it as anything like that. It's just, it's, it's not. Um, like. People, people back in the day got really super lucky, and there's no guarantee that we'll have a cata, you know, atmospheric price rises again in the future. So, just don't. It's not. Don't, I said yeah. this last podcast too. Don't see it as an investment vehicle because it's really not, and you'll get burned anyway. Yeah, I actually had to tell. Um, I actually had to tell one of my friends this. That, that pretty much that exact thing. Um, he was interested in buying some Bitcoin, but he didn't really know a lot about it. Um, but, he, you know, he's he's a libertarian, so he's, you know, heard about it a lot. He just never researched so much. And he, so he's asking me about it. And we eventually started talking about the price. And I was like, and I was like, dude, if you're, if you're wanting to buy some for me right now because you think you're going to make a lot of money like in the next six months, uh, you know, then just don't worry about it. Because if you buy right now, you're guaranteed to lose money. Um, and I told him, you know, only buy right now if you're genuinely interested in the idea behind Bitcoin and the technology um, and the benefits it provides to society. Uh, because right now, you know, just quite frankly, it's not a very good because you know, it's fallen by almost $300 since July. So, um, yeah, that's definitely not a smart thing to do. It, you know, if you're going to invest all this money into Bitcoin because you think another price surge that hap- like that happened in November 2013 is going to happen in November 2014, you're probably going to lose a lot of money. You know, so I, if... And you'll like, you'll get pretty mad and angry and like you know disillusioned yeah. when you when that when the price does fall. Yeah. So, like only 
you should anybody any person should only invest in bitcoin they should like they should only they should invest in the idea the ideology behind bitcoin and the blockchain technology you know they shouldn't invest in the bitcoin price um it's way it's way too early to start doing that because you know the user base isn't large enough so you know the price is incredibly volatile so you know if day trading bitcoin is a great way to lose all your money uh, yeah so if you're not really that concerned about losing money and you just want to see how bitcoin grows like you know that would be my advice to anybody really only invest whatever you're willing to lose Yep. That's what they always say. Good words to live by. Yep, but that's my tangent about bubbles. Yeah, I guess we can move on to the next topic now. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that was pretty good. Probably deserves its own segment. Um, so next topic is more PayPal news. It seems like we talk about PayPal every week now. They're pretty <laughs> deep into the public discussion now. Hey, that's what they want. That's why they're accepting Bitcoin. Yep. Exactly. They've got all of us in the Bitcoin community fawning over them now. So yep. the latest news out of PayPal now isn't directly related to Bitcoin, but it could have some impact on the future. Is that PayPal has broken up with their parent company, eBay. PayPal and eBay are now two separate companies. Um, they're going to have brand new CEOs for each one. Uh, just... It's pretty pretty huge shakeup. Um, PayPal is going to be an independent company with their with their own shares, you know, their own stocks and everything like that. Uh, supposedly, it's going to enable both companies to focus better on their respective markets. So eBay wants to keep innovating in the the marketplace area, and PayPal wants to keep innovating in like the payments area, and eBay eBay is obviously an, an online marketplace, but PayPal, a lot of observers are saying that PayPal wants to focus more and more on in-person payments. Now that everyone has smartphones, uh, the mobile payment space is quickly, quickly evolving with things like Bitcoin, with things like Apple Pay came out recently, and PayPal wants to be really nimble in, a, in, in tackling this in tackling this area and they don't want to be hamstrung by a parent company that isn't fully dedicated to the payment space so that's why they that's the main reason why they are kind of splitting up but it kind of it kind of explains a little bit why they've embraced bitcoin so much and all these like kind of new methods of payments and you know new marketing campaign and all this like I think they've been they've been planning for a while this split and they're kind of trying to reinvent themselves by being their own company by embracing Bitcoin by using this one touch payment system that is trying to compete with Apple Pay and I mean it's act it's a really good move it's what they kind of needed to do to stay competitive in this space because PayPal was kind of kind of starting to go the way of the dinosaur starting to get a little bit obsolete compared to competitors out there and uh, now being an independent company they'll be able to innovate faster uh, focus more on what they want to do and hopefully f focus more on Bitcoin integrate Bitcoin more deeply into PayPal so um, what do you what do you think about this brand new brand new split I was gonna say pretty much the same thing you said uh you know like what if paypal took so long to start or integrating bitcoin with with its putting them back because of ebay yeah so maybe maybe now that paypal is an independent company um they might be a little bit more aggressive in their bitcoin integration which would be pretty cool yeah um but you know what? I actually didn't know that eBay owned PayPal. Oh yeah. Somehow, somehow that like went right over my head, like completely got past me. Yeah, I didn't know that. So that's pretty interesting to me, at least. Yeah, I think well, PayPal was independent a, a long time ago, years and years ago. I think they were founded in like 1998. 
founded by Elon Musk. He was a co-founder. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that either. <laughs> yeah, Elon Musk did PayPal before he did Tesla. And, you know, then sold it to investors. I'm not sure if he sold it to investors and then, then they sold it to eBay or if he sold directly to eBay. I'd have to look that up. But, yeah, it eventually got in the hands of eBay. eBay bought them because eBay wanted to integrate them deeper into their own marketplace and all that. But, like, now, like, they kind of out, outgrown each other in a way, you know? Uh, eBay wants to do their own thing more and PayPal wants to do their own thing uh, more and, you know, look deeper into Bitcoin and now PayPal is its own company again. Now, now there's a talk, there's a lot of speculation going on in the financial world about whether investors should invest in PayPal now that they can buy dedicated PayPal stocks. And, uh, you know, it really depends on what we see come out of PayPal in the very near future. Now that they are their own company, are they going to innovate faster? Are they going to create new innovative ways of, you know, person to person payments? You know, are they going to lower their fees a little bit, you know, to stay, to stay competitive with Apple Pay and Bitcoin? Um, so it, it, it really depends on what, what comes out of this and what they're going to do with their newfound freedom. But it's a good sign. It's a really good sign. I'm like in general I'm a I'm a huge supporter of like when companies kind of split up into separate companies and become more nimble in their individual pieces rather than just being just one big gigantic blob of of conglomerate, you know, services and stuff like that, which is a huge flaw that we always keep seeing in the telecommunications industry. Monopolies always happening. So it's nice to see for once um a large, you know, tech internet commerce company kind of split up so that both sides can uh, pursue their goals in more targeted ways. So I think it's pretty good. Right. Specialization always makes things more efficient. Yeah. If you just have, if you just have one, you know, giant firm that controls everything, uh, they're not going to be able to run things efficiently as if you had, you know, like ten smaller firms each doing one thing. So, uh, so yeah, it's probably it's probably great for both eBay and PayPal because, you know, when when they were one company, eBay was probably, you know, may have had a lot of trouble because you know there were conflicting interests there. Like PayPal wanted to do one thing, but doing that might have hurt eBay eBay wanted to do one thing, but doing that might hurt PayPal. Well, now they can just both do whatever they want without hurting each other at all, and that's great. And I hope PayPal does more with Bitcoin because PayPal right now is, you know, the most popular online payment platform. Uh, so the more they do with Bitcoin, you know, the more it gets out there to people who uh, wouldn't even know it exists. Yeah. There's a lot of great potential for Bitcoin. But no matter what PayPal does with Bitcoin, you know, it's really great for PayPal as a company. So, Yeah, and hopefully we see like brand new innovative features that PayPal can create with Bitcoin that we don't see anywhere else in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Like in the past few weeks, like we've, we've talked about all the other PayPal developments, they have enabled certain merchants to accept Bitcoin through PayPal for like digital goods and services and small things like that, small subsidiaries of PayPal, like Braintree. And now, you know, that's that's just that's just a minor thing. We talked about that. That's just really a minor thing. But it's a sign yeah, of I things to come. I still don't even know what Braintree is. It's 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 like a feature. It's a feature. Like basically a merchant can insert the Braintree code into their website and that allows them to accept payments for their for their thing. It's like a payment processor that's supposed to be really like simple and easy to implement. Um, but not a lot of people use it. It's just like only a few thousand merchants or something. And okay. then the, the payments hub integration, which we talked about last week, adds another few thousand merchants. But like they have to opt in to the to the Bitcoin acceptance. Like they have to create an account with with Coinbase and such. So it's, it's just minor minor developments, and it's like 
it creates nice headlines in the Bitcoin community and the, in the tech community, but like it's just really super minor features at this point. I am right. really, really looking forward to seeing what PayPal comes up with that's really original in terms of actually managing Bitcoin transactions and managing Bitcoin balances. Like the moment we see PayPal integrate uh, Bitcoin into their full-blown PayPal application, that's when things get really interesting. Because um, then they can, no. they can compete directly with Coinbase, maybe even compete directly with Circle. They can compete with Circle and, and maybe enable instant Bitcoin purchasing right within PayPal instead of having to go on localbitcoins.com and paying someone through there with PayPal for Bitcoins. So there's a lot of possibilities, and, and I'm sure they're looking into these. You know, I hope they make a decent Bitcoin debit card. Because mm. I'm still hurt about Zappo. I was so excited about Zappo, and they let me down. Yeah. So PayPal, counting on you. Well, you know, I mean, I mentioned this in an earlier podcast. PayPal does have, like, their own kind of debit card service where you can get a debit card with them. Um, I'll... I'll show it right here. I won't show my actual number, but I have it right here. Like you can link it directly with your PayPal account, and if you have money in your PayPal account, you can send it directly to the bank account associated with this card, and then boom, your PayPal funds are spendable um, on this on this card. And it's it's this little thing right here. This is the PayPal debit card, and this is basically what I use. Um, when I convert my Bitcoin payments into fiat, just go on localbitcoins.com and um, sell my Bitcoins to someone who is using PayPal to pay me, then boom, that's money in my PayPal account. And then I can instantly just go on the website and transfer it from my PayPal account to the debit card. So that's a solution. It just takes a few steps. But it's it's like the best solution right now that's available for transferring Bitcoin money into a debit card. And it works pretty well. They just need to kind of streamline it. It'd be good if they streamlined it and kind of made it easier. Like if this pulled directly from your PayPal account without having to transfer it manually on the website, that would be good. That'd be really, that'd be really awesome. But right now, I think it's the best option. Well, I think, you know, in terms of Bitcoin integration, they just need like a dedicated card and they, and they can create, you know, they can create an online wallet, an online Bitcoin wallet. And then it'd be like Zappo does, you know, if we had access to Zappo, that, that's how it would work. But it just, you know, at, at the point of sale, it, it takes your Bitcoins, sells them on the exchange, deposits the fiat into the company's bank account um, or whatever kind of account. Uh, you know that'd be that'd be so much easier than you know selling them on local bitcoins, than transferring it from PayPal to this debit card, or even debit card directly accessible to your PayPal account. It'd be even easier than that. And so that's something giving yeah. you that that's a freebie, PayPal. When you start when you start integrating Bitcoin more fully do that and do you'll it. be super rich and yeah. um you know i i won't charge a finder's fee so I, i'll just you know buy one of your debit cards yeah please paypal do this service for us it'd be so <laughs> awesome it'd be so awesome just like i mean imagine it imagine it just like opening up your paypal app on your phone like they give you a bitcoin address like i mean if they if they allowed Bitcoin buying within PayPal, then you could just buy the Bitcoins within PayPal, and then that's associated with the debit card like right away, like right within the app without having to move any funds around on the website, on your computer or anything. Super smooth. And then, boom, everyone would be using Bitcoin, everyone would be using PayPal, and then PayPal would just basically punch Apple Pay right in the kisser. <laughs> <laughs> Knockout punch. And, uh, and boom, PayPal wins wins the payment wins the payment wars right there free idea do it paypal please you don't even have to give us a free debit card well, i'll pay the fee for the debit card i don't want anything for giving you this idea i just want you to do it just want the service <laughs> yeah um so if that pretty much covers it for the paypal story 
Um, let's move on to the next topic, which is uh, deals with Reddit. Reddit, Reddit um, is considering, actually, I mean, it's basically a plan at this point. They are going to issue shares in the website uh, for investors and also give 10% of the shares directly to the users of Reddit. And they've already raised $50 million dollars from investors, big high profile investors like Mark Andreessen, uh, Peter Thiel, and Snoop Dogg. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I I forgot about Snoop Dogg, that's the way. There's another really random celebrity that invested who, you know, it was just as funny as Snoop Dogg, but I can't remember who it was. Oh. Iggy Azalea? No, I doubt it. No, it was, it was a definitely, it was definitely a dude. Okay. But, you know, it was just just as random, even more random than Snoop Dogg, because Snoop Dogg actually goes on Reddit a lot. I was just like, really, that person? Like, but, yeah. Huh. Anyways, that was yeah. kind of off topic. Totally, a uh, total of $50 million for Reddit's issuance of shares, and it's most likely going to be on some kind of cryptocurrency platform. And they've they talked about this on the Reddit blog, and uh, this was covered by TechCrunch um, and and CoinDesk and CryptoCoins News. Um, the only, the question now is, are they going to use a Bitcoin-based platform for issuing these shares, such as Counterparty, or are they going to create a brand new alternative cryptocurrency directly for Reddit? And if they do that, they can't take Redcoin because that's already taken by someone. So it's got to be something else. Okay, so I actually saw something about this on the Bitcoin subreddit. Um, I didn't actually read that, uh, which is a problem I have. I never read anything, it seems like. Um, but the the headline was a quote from the um, the cryptocurrency developer guy that they hired to work on the project. Ryan Charles. Um, yeah, and he, he said another altcoin he definitely wants to do something built on top of bitcoin um he so came from BitPay, actually oh i didn't know that yeah so you know that's definitely i'd say that's pretty good evidence that their reddit cryptocurrency is going to be built on top of bitcoin um that's what it looks like at this point yeah but then you know the question is how exactly are they going to do that what are, what are they going to use you know yeah, um, it would if they did y build it on Bitcoin. Um, I don't know that much about Counterparty, but it sounds like Counterparty would probably be the best option to go right now because they've already got a system built for basically creating stocks for companies and create 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 Reddit shares, and they're going to issue ten percent back to the community directly like how is how is that going to work out as well like are, are, is it just going to be if you have a reddit account then you get it like a certain amount of that 10 percent what if you have multiple reddit accounts are you going to get multiple shares um so there's a lot of questions that still need to be answered a lot of details that still need to be worked out they didn't talk about how they're going to distribute it i just assumed that they would have like an IPO and people could and you know people would buy the shares and then they could sell them to other you know members but... yeah yeah they haven't they haven't really said about the details yet um but an an IPO sounds likely they but either way even if they do do an IPO the IPO would just be 90% of the shares and at least 10% goes directly to the users for free they don't have to buy into it. So a lot of people are saying, oh, that's that's great. It shows that Reddit's dedicated to their community. And yeah, I mean, it's it's true. It's nice to get 10% of, of the shares of this like IPO thingy. Um, but yeah, we've got, we've got, there's a lot of questions that still need to be, need to be answered. Yeah, how this. would, how would they distribute it? Cause I mean, the cryptocurrency thing makes it really easy. Um, because, you know, it's really easy to, you know, create like a tipping platform. Well, I say easy, relatively easy because it's been done before to make like, a, you know, a tipping bot and then they can 
just do that and then you know they can go and create the people who get it can go and create an online wallet or whatever to store it um hopefully they would have a wallet right there on reddit for you to store it as well yeah yeah but like how yeah that is kind of a tough question how are they going to distribute it because are they just going to like distribute it evenly um among every this on reddit like if they do that, that's kind of a bad idea because you have to, you know, you have to leave out the inactive accounts. You have to leave out the, you know, multiple accounts owned by the same person. All the bots and spam. And yeah. All that crap. Yeah. So, and plus, if you if you do break it down that far, um, you know, that fraction of a share is going to be like so worthless that, you know, people aren't really going to be interested in doing anything with it. I think. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe a, a decent way of distributing based on like based on valuable users to the community would just be basing it off of how much karma your Reddit account has collected so far. So you know maybe well, but then there's the, then there's the karma, karma spammers though. There's the people who spam for karma though. That you know that yeah. wouldn't really be fair. Yeah. So yeah, I mean there's. Yeah, you but, gotta you know, that, find a way to that's weed why out those they, people as well. That's why they hired the BitPay guy, not us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Um, so yeah, good luck, Reddit. It's it's it at the very least, it's a very interesting idea, and it shows like it shows the crazy possibilities of issuing um, public shares through the internet for a social media website. Like, you ain't going to see this anywhere else. Like, imagine Facebook issuing public shares on a cryptocurrency for their users. That's never going to happen. Yeah. I hate Facebook, man. <laughs> it's yeah. awful. Yeah. I mean, they Facebook, their model is just farming their users for content and and and, you know, showing ads to their users based on what what their users like you know what facebook pages they like and then just trying to shove other related things into their face on their news feed even though none of their friends actually posted about that so facebook's model is kind of messed up and people use it anyway for some reason Mm -hmm. it's where everyone is yeah it's, it's free but a lot of things are free now we have the technology now where you know social media sites can be free and also like efficient and and like really good for the users and and not show constant ads disguised as you know posts so and that and twitter's going in that direction as well twitter recently announced that they're going to start showing people um like tweets in their in their timeline that aren't necessarily from their people they follow and it won't even necessarily be in the order, in the chronological order, as it is now. They might sh- show things that Twitter decides is important t- more towards the top. And that's because Twitter is a for-profit company. They had an IPO, and they have investors now who expect a return on profits. And the only way to do that is to push ads in front of people. So it's good to see Reddit going in the opposite direction for once and trying to at least give back to their users in an innovative way. Um, it's just that hopefully, you know, this bit pay guy, Ryan Charles can help them, um, do it in a way that's really successful and is not just like a new altcoin pump, you know? So best of luck to him. So you want to talk about Silk Road now? Yeah. Um, let's, yeah, let's move on to Silk Road. All right. So... Well, we have we have a couple stories about it, so you want to do the the FBI one first? Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, it's been a year now since Silk Road was taken down by the feds, um, and Ross Ulbricht, its alleged operator, was arrested. And it's been really slow in the case for like discovery of evidence and stuff like that, and like the prosecution is still withholding some evidence from the defense but um one of the things that came out last month uh concerning the ross ulbricht case was that 
the FBI discovered the Silk Road servers um, by looking at a, a leaky CAPTCHA um, form on the Silk Road website. So like you would log in and, and it would show a random set of numbers and letters that you have to enter in to prove that you're, you know, that you're not a robot. But the problem was that that was somehow linked to the clear net, the regular internet, and it was leaking, you know, data that, that wasn't hidden by Tor. So that was, that was what the FBI said, that they used that to find the Silk Road servers and um, and basically take them down. Um, but a lot of technical experts who are experts in this kind of thing, in computer science and how these systems actually work, uh, looked at that argument and said that it doesn't really make a lot of sense and it's not technically possible and that it's most likely that the FBI is lying about how they uh, took down the servers. And... Um, that, yeah, it's, it's it's the the FBI is basically full of shit concerning how they how they got that information. Um, they're trying to pull one over on everyone who doesn't know about the technical intricacies about this stuff. But the people who are aware of the technical aspects are looking at this and like this doesn't really add up. It doesn't really make sense. Um, and. You know, we're getting into tinfoil hat territory here a little bit, conspiracy level stuff, but like, it's possible that they kind of got it another way, got the servers another way, found out them um, through some sort of hacking, through some sort of surveillance that isn't technically legal, and they are using the CAPTCHA argument as a form of parallel construction to kind of point to evidence where there wasn't necessarily uh, any evidence of that. Because that, that would be legal, right? If they found the info through um, a flaw in the CAPTCHA code on the Silk Road website. Oh, like, okay, the operator was just negligent and he messed up and, and didn't cover all of his bases, and that's how they found him. But if that's not true, how did they actually find the info, and why aren't they revealing that? So it raises a lot of questions about the legitimacy of the federal government's arguments in this case, and it kind of makes you wonder, like, what, you know, if they wanted to take down Silk Road bad enough, what links would they go to to do this? And probably pretty, pretty, pretty um, far links to, to take it down, and not necessarily legal either. But they can't, they can't admit that it's illegal methods in court, or else they wouldn't convict Ross Ulbricht, so they have to kind of make up this other thing on the side about the CAPTCHA leak, and, um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of messed up, and it all got, it'll, it'll get hashed out in court, and hopefully the jury isn't, you know, duped by the prosecution's, um, faulty arguments about this thing, and hopefully the technical experts actually have a say in debunking this, so, yeah, what do you, what do you think? So this... I mean, the technical stuff is way over my head. I've, yeah, mine you too. know, I, I I looked through the article. I have no idea what this dude is talking about, but it would not surprise me in the slightest if the FBI was lying about how they gained access to the servers. Um, from what I from what I did understand was basically there's no way the FBI could have accessed the servers the way that they did because there's a really strong wall between the front end and the back end of of the servers and you have to do like some super you know hacking thing to get to the back end um but yeah it it wouldn't surprise me at all if the FBI did that because um we know that that the US government doesn't care about following the law because we have things like the NSA and um this uh, you know, police story that we're getting ready to talk about in a second. Not really federal government, but you know, it's still same idea. Law enforcement. Yeah, yeah, they don't they don't care about following the law because you know they're effectively above the law, even if they're not legally. And um, you know, Ross Ulbricht's legal team has already accused the FBI of not having a warrant to search the servers. 
Um, and that's totally believable too, you know. I be- I believe them because they've done all kind they've done all kinds of shady things in the past. It just it just goes to show that uh, that the federal government will pretty much do anything to stop things that it doesn't like, even if it doesn't have the authority to, to do it. And it's kind of scary to be honest, but it's not surprising, which is sad. Like being being scared has become the norm. You know, and I hate it. Yeah, if they if if you are a target for them and they want to take you down, they'll find some way to do it and 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 basically try and build up the evidence after the fact. Uh, you know, uh, Which is this... exactly what they're doing with Ross Ulbricht. You know, they, they arrested him and they started building their case after they arrested him. Yeah. Yeah, after they arrested him, they, then they took the servers, they took the bitcoins, did all that stuff, and then basically decided after the fact, oh... You know, there was this flaw in the CAPTCHA. That's how there was a leak in the code, and it was connected to the clear net, and that's how we got him. Uh, it's 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 shady. It's shady, man. Like, they, they, they find a target, and it's like, okay, let's take this guy down. And they it's there's a term for it, parallel construction. They construct a parallel set of, of possible evidence how they could have gotten him after the fact that that would theoretically go through legal channels but doesn't didn't necessarily happen and that's how they that's what they use to win a court case against him because you can be damn sure that the jury in the courtroom regular people who are just summoned for jury duty don't know crap about the technical aspects of leaky captcha code and whether or not the government would just kind of make that up in order to construct a case against someone who they want to convict no matter no matter what and damn, they want to convict Ross Solberg bad. Like this guy ran a, a completely free market on the on the dark net allegedly, and and, and basically allowed drug sales uh, between free people, nonviolent people who you know didn't really hurt anyone besides the fact of maybe just um, supporting some people's drug addictions. But you know, voluntary sales, and um, it's like no, this this is, goes too far, way too far. We've got to take this guy down and and construct a case later on about how we're gonna put him in jail and make an example out of him for future people who might try and do this. And he's Ross Orberg is going to prison no matter what. Um, you know, he's he's gonna go away, even if there's just just definitive evidence that um, the federal government completely just grossly broke the law. Um, he's still, they're still going to find some reason to put him away. And if they don't, if he gets let off, he's going to mysteriously disappear. Like, Ross Ulbricht is not going to be because the federal government doesn't want him to be. Um, and, and they have the power to do things like that. Which again is really scary and wrong. Yeah, uh, that would be scary if he wins the case anyway, and you know, his car blows up the next yeah. week or something. Or has a sudden heart attack, you know, the very next day. Yeah. You know. They want to win no matter what. So. Yep. Oh, tyrannical governments. Tyrant's gonna tyrant. That's what's gonna happen. <laughs> um, so uh, other Silk Road. Relate or not Silk Road, but just Darknet related news. Um, Darknets are still going strong one year later after Silk Road was taken down. Obviously, you know, Silk Road 2.0 was put up one month after the first one was taken down. And at this point, there's like, there's at least a dozen successful marketplaces with like a couple dozen more that weren't successful and were like scams and people got robbed or, you know, admins ran away with the money or whatever. But now there's like there's like a dozen successful darknet markets um, that basically do the same thing as Silk Road. Uh, one of them, the biggest one at this point now, um, I don't know if it's pronounced Agora or Agora, but Agora is now the biggest darknet market, and it's bigger than Silk Road ever was, and um, 
is it, like it actually has a nicer interface based on the screenshots that I've seen. And, what great progress you made, FBI! You you made darknet markets a lot richer and more user friendly. Yeah. What a great yeah. victory uh, in the drug war. I know. Yeah, and, and and you know, once Silk Road was taken down, everyone who participates in darknet markets looks at that and like, okay, here's the steps that we have to do to prevent that from happening <laughs> to us again. Yep. <laughs> Here's, here's the steps how to that we not have to get to. caught. Yeah, here's how to not get caught and be more successful than Silk Road ever hoped to be. Okay, well, this capture thing, we're not going to have that possible vulnerability or any of these other things. Um, and then, uh, you know, D uh, Open Bazaar as well, which was originally known as Dark Market. Um, it's not specifically for drugs. It's really for any any products that people want to transact willingly that they can't necessarily transact elsewhere that the government might, might not like and it's like something like open bazaar you can't take down it's not on a, on a server somewhere even if you did manage to find a leaky capture or any of that other bullshit that points to a server somewhere there is no server it's a peer-to-peer -peer network and you can't take down a peer-to-peer -peer network as we've seen in the examples of BitTorrent and bitcoin so it's like it's evolution. It's natural selection. People see Silk Road get taken down, and it's like, okay, uh, here's how we can innovate on that model and make it stronger than ever before. So, it's constant evolution in the darknet space to make it more resilient than ever before. Yeah, I think these... Uh crypto anarchist people are some of the smartest people uh, that are around right now because they're just you know they're using computers to just mas basically make the government irrelevant or you know make it impotent um, at least and you know th the, these governments have like unlimited access to resources they have the ability to print money infinitely um they've got all the they weapons have, they have complete control over everyone's lives uh but these guys uh decided that they didn't like that so they made a computer program that uh bypasses all that nonsense <laughs> and, and it's crazy to transact They're... freely person to person you know selling anything they want literally anything they want yeah well you know once once the program is out there once they open source it, it it can't be stopped it'll never go away and you know that's that's really crazy to think about especially uh especially cody wilson uh and uh defense distributed in their you know uh, 3d print guns project um after they after they open sourced the the files to print uh, the the Liberator pistol and the plastic lower receiver for AR-15s, um, you know, gun control is now literally impossible. Regardless, um, you know, you you're never gonna get away. You're never gonna get rid of guns because it's on the internet now. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can just download these... a file and print it within your home or at some local 3D printer, and boom you don't have to walk into a gun shop to to get a gun yeah it's it's crazy like who would have thought that you know in 1995 when the internet was you know first declassified from the military and made public uh you know who would have thought that people would figure out how to use the internet to combat government tyranny like it's just a crazy it's just a crazy thing to think about the revolution is happening right right under our noses right under the government's nose it's happening yeah. right there on the internet and they can't do anything about it and you know they're they're disproving the skeptics you know every step every, you know at every little point along the way they're disproving the skeptics they're like but you know if the, if the government doesn't control this aspect of their lives there'd be so much chaos like all all these things would happen you know well they're pro like they're forcing control out of the government's hands uh with things like darknet markets on the deep web and um you know people aren't dying uh people are dying less actually yeah there, there's actually less violence now um 
or not overall less violence, but the online drug world is much less violent compared to gangs and cartels who are doing it in the physical world. And people, people aren't getting, um, cocaine laced with, uh, baking powder and antifreeze like they do in the in the physical world when they buy from a drug dealer because that drug um, dealer would get bad reviews on the dark net markets <laughs> yeah you know they're not they're not been soaked in gasoline or whatever <laughs> you know they're not they're not getting they're not paying for marijuana and getting a bag of cilantro you know like <laughs> Or even just, just like a, some some crappy marijuana plant that was grown in like some guy's closet, like under a lamp or something. Like there's actual huge industrial operations now that grow this stuff like super super high quality at like the highest possible quality that you can scientifically do with the current methods, and like that stuff is getting sold and and, and it's high quality and it's safe and people know right. what they're getting when they buy it. Right. It's just. It proves like things like this prove that markets do work. Markets are self-regulating. Um, there is no invisible hand. Um, you know, it, it comes from people interacting with each other, acting in their self-interest, doing what's best for them, and it ends up creating this huge, like, vastly complex system of of give and take, constant negotiations and concessions. And at least this just giant self-regulating system that makes everybody better off. And, um, you know, people are proving that by forcefully taking control out of the government's hands through these computer programs. It, you know, yeah. like, we're not, the internet is being used for much more than playing video games now, and it's pretty amazing. Like, it, Much more than playing video once, games or blogging you know, or any of that other stuff. Once it catches on, it's going to really stir things up and it's going to be pretty interesting yeah i think we we've, we've discussed about this topic before on the podcast like i think you mentioned a long time ago that like this whole crypto anarchy like political movement thing wasn't really possible in practical terms until we had the technological tools with the internet and computers and all that so now that we do have those things we can actually see like free markets being really effective about like weeding out the the bad actors right about making the whole thing work like really efficiently and just just increasing the overall efficiency of the market and we like the government is being made totally obsolete by uh by the internet really yeah it's pretty crazy yeah um, should we should we end on that note, a fairly positive note? Because we we had a, we had a note, another story um, prepared that we were going to talk about how the police were uh, how the police are seizing a lot of people's money and assets on the highway uh, by pulling people over in cars and, and stealing their money based on bullshit accusations and suspicions. Um, but you know we we've, we've been talking for a while and, and that that's a pretty good note to end on how. The internet's allowing people to um, have more freedom in the face of in, in the face of an increasingly tyrannical and radical and and, and violent government. Um, internet's increasing freedom overall. Internet and yep. computer tools and new programs and cryptocurrencies and, and all that. It's all it's all a huge ecosystem of of really innovative solutions for freeing people and giving them more financial options and more markets to participate in and um yeah I, I think that's good to end on yeah the next the next 20 to 50 years are going to be really crazy and i think you know distributed networks are going to be a lot more commonplace and the government is going to be a lot more obscure and outdated than it already is yeah pretty cool feeling that the like government's just going to be relegated. They're just going to be they're going to be a niche, really, <laughs> and their niche is going to be wars. That's <laughs> all they're going to do is just fight yeah, there's, wars. They're just going to be mercenaries. The they're yeah. they're going to devolve into mercenary forces. Yeah, 
That's why Obama started this war, right? This brand new war in the Middle East, because <laughs> they can't really do anything else effectively besides drop bombs on people. Just bomb everything in sight. <sighs> can't control our own country. Why is my... <laughs> Can't can't control our own country. You might as well destroy other countries instead. Yep. All right. Well, um, that does it for this episode of the Coin Brief Podcast. Thanks everyone for listening this week again, and um, please like our video, subscribe to us, and everything. Follow us on Twitter, all that good stuff. Um, comment with your perspective perspectives on the topics that we talked about. Um where where you think PayPal is going with their with their newfound independence, um, whether you think Ross Ulbricht is gonna get convicted on all charges or not, how long he's gonna be forced to sit in a jail cell for doing nonviolent offenses, um, whether you think PayPal is or, or whether you think think Circle, my bad, is Circle is gonna provide buying pressure to the Bitcoin market with instant buys and all that. Um, so yeah, participate in the discussion. Um, uh, subscribe, like us, and um, yeah, we'll see you guys next week with some more news in the cryptocurrency space. I'm Sean Wentz. And I'm Evan Faggart. And we'll see you guys next week with more news in Bitcoin. Thanks for listening.